Well, this morning we're going to backtrack a little bit in this, these stories about Abraham that we've been reading where we see how Abraham gives up different things as we look through that during the season of Lent. Last week we saw that in the near sacrifice of Isaac, Abraham's faith was only strong because God was faithful. We talked about how our faith is only as strong as the faithfulness of God. Today we're going to jump back several years to the moment when God's promise changes Abram's name to Abraham. And then we're going to look at how that same promise redefines the name of Jesus during his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And then finally, what it means for us to give up our name and receive the name that God gives to us. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your word and ask that you'd open our hearts and speak clearly to us this morning and change us. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So we're reading from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 8. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your number. <coughs> Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. Again, this is the word of the Lord. Praise you, God. Both of our scriptures this morning are all about names. In the time of Abraham, and even still of Jesus, names had quite a bit more significance than they tend to in our culture today. A person's name said something about who they were, and what they were going to do in their life. It was more than just a label by which you could call someone. It was more of a statement, or even a prophecy, about this person's destiny. Well, the first name that I want to look at in our text this morning is the name of God. We're told that when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Now, remember that whenever you see the word Lord, like it was in our text, it's all capital letters. When you see Lord in all capital letters, that indicates the personal name of God. Yahweh, the name by which he revealed himself to Moses. Well, now, if you think about it, Moses comes after Abraham. So Abraham doesn't actually know this personal name of God yet. Now, the author who's writing about the story, who very well could have been Moses himself, does know the personal name of God. So he uses it. But Abraham, or Abram at this point, he doesn't know yet this personal name of God. And so instead, God introduces himself to Abram as God Almighty. He says, I am God Almighty. Or in Hebrew, El Shaddai. El Shaddai is what translates to God Almighty, and that's how God introduces himself to Abram in this text. Now what's interesting about that name, El Shaddai, is that it almost always, in the Old Testament, appears in connection with the fulfillment of a divine promise, especially a promise 
to give someone lots of descendants. Almost every time you see El Shaddai, God is showing up to confirm or make a promise with someone that they will have many descendants after them. So that's how God introduces himself, because that's exactly what God wants to talk about, again, with Abram in this story. God says, I will confirm my covenant between me and you, and I will greatly increase your numbers. You will be the father of many nations. God has arrived to confirm his promise, or his covenant, with Abram. And so he introduces himself as El Shaddai, the God who keeps promises. And that covenant, those promises from God, actually change Abram's name. God says, no longer will you be called Abram, your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. Now, the name Abram means exalted father. And ever since Abram first responded to God's call, he left home, he has been obedient to God, and God has continued to exalt him and make him an exalted father, to live up to his name. God has made him a blessing to the people around him. He has made Abram victorious over all of his enemies. And now God is about to give Abram a son, Isaac, and then many more descendants after him. So Abraham, this exalted father, will become the father of many nations. And that's what the name Abraham means. The father of a multitude. And so God changes Abram's name to Abraham to make him a father of a multitude. So Abram is renamed according to what God is promising to do in his life. Abram's life is no longer about making a name for himself. His life is now about making a name for God through his descendants. God's promise is not just about exalting Abram, although he does that. His promise is more about blessing the rest of the world through Abraham and his offspring, particularly through Jesus Christ. So now let's fast forward a couple of thousand years to Jesus Christ when he makes his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Now God had promised to Abraham that kings would come from him. Now Jesus is not just a king. Jesus, of course, we know is the king of kings. And he comes now riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, on a colt. And as he rode into the city, many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread branches that they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. But the word Hosanna is actually a cry for help. When you translate it, Hosanna in Hebrew means save us. So that's what these people are crying out. When Jesus comes into Jerusalem, they're saying, save us. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Save us in the highest. See, the people recognize, or at least they hope, that Jesus is the king that they've been waiting for. That he is the Messiah who would bring God's salvation. And that makes sense. Because Jesus' name, which is a form of the name of Joshua, actually means Yahweh is salvation. That's what Jesus' name means. So it makes sense that the people would expect and hope that he would be their Messiah to bring God's salvation. But the real question here is, what kind of salvation? At the beginning of Matthew, when the angel is talking to Mary. The angel tells Mary to name her baby Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. Now what the people really want is a Messiah who will come and save them from the power of Rome, this occupying 
force that keeps them under its foot. That's who they want to be saved from. But Jesus came to save them from their sins. He has not come to conquer Rome, but to conquer the sin that holds his people captive. Not only that, but entering the city on a donkey instead of a war horse was a traditional sign of peace in this culture. If there was peace in the land, then it was customary for the king to enter the city riding on a donkey instead of a horse. And so the statement that Jesus is making when he enters Jerusalem is, I have not come to bring war against your oppressors, but to bring peace between you and God. And that is what God's promise of salvation is ultimately about in the first place. So just as God's promise changed Abram's name to Abraham, so Jesus' name is changed from meaning the kind of salvation that a conquering hero would bring to the kind of salvation that a suffering servant. And in Jesus, the gates of salvation are flung open wide so that people from all nations may have peace with God through Christ. Now, what about your name? We don't put as much importance on our actual names as Abraham did, as, as people in Jesus' day did, but we still give a lot of importance to our name, and we still try to make a name for ourselves in a number of ways. We try to make our, a name for ourselves by being successful, by getting people to like us, by trying to, to be happy in life. We want people to know us by a certain name or a certain label. But God's covenant, God's promises, change our name as well. God's promise gives us a new name that none of our efforts could ever provide. And that name is simply child of God. In 1 John 3, it says, Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. That is our new name in Jesus Christ. The same covenant of love that changed Abram's name and redefined the meaning of salvation in Jesus has also renamed every one of us who is in Christ. You are no longer successful or not, confident or not, happy or not. You are now simply beloved child. Go. So give up your own name. Give up your efforts to try and make a name for yourself and just receive the name that God has given to you in Christ. It's a better name than we could ever make for ourselves. And it's a name that will redefine who you are and what you're called to be and what you're called to do. A name that reminds you not only who you are, but whose you are. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.